Welcome to Elixir Wizards, a podcast brought to you by Smart Logic, a custom web and mobile development shop based in Baltimore. This season's theme is working with Elixir, and today we're talking about performance with Paul Schoenfelder and Hans Elias Josephson from Dockyard. Say hi, guys. Hey. Hey. And more than just performance, we really want to dive into a project that you've recently been working on, uh, Lumen. So could you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your background, Dockyard, and how y'all got started with Elixir? Sure. Yeah, I can go quick. I'm Paul, and my background goes back quite a ways, so I'm not, not going to go too deep into that. But when I joined Dockyard, is basically to work on the releases functionality, getting that into core. And after that kind of happened, as far as like the 1.9 release, the next sort of project on my plate was one that Brian Cargrella, the CEO of Dockyard at the time, had brewed up, uh, which is that he wanted to bring WebAssembly or Elixir to the browser via WebAssembly because he felt that the paradigm building UIs with this sort of like actor-driven framework would make a lot of sense. I agreed with that. And so I was like, well, since I am basically out of work on like my one R&D project, maybe I can take this on. I'm already working on a compiler project of my own in my spare time. So why not? And he was like, okay, sure. So I had to evaluate like two different approaches. One was whether or not we were going to try and port the beam as is to WebAssembly. And the other would be if that was not viable in a reasonable, you know, amount of effort, what would it take to build sort of a minimal compiler, ahead of time compiler for Erlang and therefore Elixir to run that on WebAssembly. And that was a path that we ended up going down mostly because uh, after researching what it would take to get the beam to work in WebAssembly, I realized that it was going to be an enormous undertaking. Not that a new compiler is not an enormous undertaking as it has been, but one that provides a little bit of a cleaner foundation to build on. Plus, we were able to take advantage of a lot of tooling around WebAssembly uh, this way that we would have otherwise not been able to do so. And I'm going to follow up with a bunch of questions about a lot of words that you just mentioned, but I want to give Hans a chance to introduce himself and talk a little bit about his time at Dockyard and working with Elixir. So I, what I'm working with right now, my part of the compiler started off as a project I worked on in my free time, started and worked on my free time. So I was working on sort of a part of a compiler in Rust. And that ended up being more or less what was needed for Lumen. So actually, I talked to Jose, who connected me to the guys over at Dockyard. And that's how I ended up working there on on the same thing. And I've been working on that part ever since. And I think the question that I think you might have already answered this, but what exactly is Lumen and like, why is Lumen? Why did this need to happen now? So like the the one sentence description of Lumen is that it's a compiler and runtime for Erlang and Elixir and other Beam languages. And as a primary target, we have WebAssembly. So the idea is that we can compile a Elixir project, say, and compile it to the browser with WebAssembly. And that way you can write client-side applications or such things with Elixir or Beam languages. And then the, the sort of obvious follow-up for someone who's very naive like myself is, well, what is WebAssembly? Why do I want to produce WebAssembly code out of Elixir? Like, why is this important? So WebAssembly is sort of a recent development that has grown out of, well, it's well known that in browsers, uh, JavaScript has been like the only language you can ever use for writing your apps for a long time. So recently, there's been a, a effort to make it possible, at least easier, for other languages to target and, and be used in the browser. That is WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is a sort of low-level bytecode representation of code that you can do that's a lot closer to the hardware, a lot lower level than what JavaScript is. So it makes it easier for languages like C or even like a Python interpreter or something like that to run in the browser. What we use it for is that we compile Elixir code directly to WebAssembly and and load that into the browser to remove as many layers as possible between the code we run and yeah, try to get performance out of it. 
So the brass tax is being able to run Elixir in the browser. Yes. And the reason... And just be able to... More than just be able to run it, it's also being able to preserve the semantics of the language, too. I mean, that's the approach of going targeting WebAssembly versus just doing like a translation to JavaScript or something. And that was an important aspect of the project, is being able to make sure that we're bringing the language and the runtime with us, not just the syntax. Yeah, so that's the big distinction between Lumen and something like Elixir Script, which is sort of, it might look similar on the surface, but it's a lot, like whole different approach than what we're doing. All right. What roles do you play, both of you, in, in terms of Lumen? What parts of the project are you both working on? Sure. So I'm working on the, at least I'm maintaining right now, the, the front end that was originally started by, uh, by Paul and committed to the project, and also the, the IR which we'll probably get into later, but the, the representations in between and uh, various transformations that transform the code to make it, to optimize it and to, to change it around in various ways. I don't know how good of a description that is, but we'll probably get into it. I mean, Luke isn't here right now, but Luke is working on all the runtime support libraries. So it'd be basically replicating the, the functionality there and built-in functions in OTP everything under like the Erlang namespace. And I've been kind of working on a variety of different things since the inception of the project, but my primary responsibility for the last several months has been working on the code generation backend. So it's taking everything that comes out of EIR, which is the aspect that Hans is talking about that he's responsible for, and then lowering that via uh, MLR and LLVM IR. Those are the two lower level IR frameworks that are used in the code gen backend to generate native assembly or in the case of browsers, web assembly code. So I want to dive into all of these parts that you're mentioning here. We've got them in front of us. We've got a compiler, we've got an interpreter, we've got a runtime. And then inside of each of those three buckets, we've got various components. I'm trying to understand what is the, the data flow here? So I'm writing Elixir. And I imagine it goes into the front end and gets pushed out the back end in WebAssembly, correct? So we start off for Elixir, we start off by invoking the Elixir compiler, which compiles Elixir down to a Erlang, abstract Erlang tree, which is then read in by the front end of our compiler, which then lowers that ASD down to what we call EIR, which is Erlang intermediate representation. I guess is the uh, what is show done for, and in that representation, various passes are done, various transformations are done, like compiling, pattern matching down to uh, decision trees, and doing tail call elimination and various optimizations like that. Uh, what elimination? Tail call elimination. What is that? So in Erlang, you're required to, if a function is called at the tail of a function, then you're required to just not have a stack frame when returning from that. So that uh, in practice means that you can do uh, infinite loops by just recursing downwards. So we do tail call elimination by by removing any like just jumps around at the end at the tail to to represent what's uh, required by the language to uh, to the backend for where all works. And yeah, after those various passes are done, then I send it off to CodeGen, which is Pulse part of it. Yeah, I can talk about where things go from there. So there's a portion of EIR that Hans has wrote that does sort of like a lowering analysis that gives me the metadata I need then to transform the EIR that he's produced into the initial IR I use in Cogen backend, which is called MLIR. It's a sub-project of LLVM. Another, basically, it's short for multi-level intermediate representation. So it's like a higher level IR than LLVM, which is extremely low level, not like assembly low level, but very close and allows, you know, transforming that higher level IR that we generate from the front end through a series of lowering transformations. And what I mean by lowering is taking high level things like uh, ifs, like cases, pattern matching kind of stuff, lowering that down into primitives like branches and jumps, taking the higher level 
concepts from Erlang and, and dropping them down as low as I can go and then letting LVM take it from there. MLIR takes care of actually lowering most of what I generate in MLIR to LLVM for us. And the, I have to write some custom lowerings for things that don't have like a built in representation in MLIR. But one of the, and then from LLVM IR, we get all the native code generated from there. And then the compiler also does linking of all the object files we create. So for every Erlang module, uh, we generate an object file. So an object file is just like the, binary representation of that native code that has all the symbols and things like that debug information all that the linker then takes those object files and weaves them together into an executable or in the case of WebAssembly, a WebAssembly module and that results in either archive in the case of a library or an executable in the case of you know an actual app that you're going to run for our purposes one of the interesting things I wanted to touch on too from on MLIR and the reason why I'm using that instead of going straight to LLVM IR, other than the fact that it has some nice things that are just convenient to use is that it was designed for the TensorFlow project. Originally, it's based around a sort of improved IR form that we also use in EIR. So it's a graph based IR instead of an SSA. IR. The difference is not super important right now. It's just suffice to say that it allows for a lot of interesting transformations. And for what we're interested in, it is being able to optimize things that are traditionally difficult to optimize in general, but in particular with Erlang. Computationally heavy tasks have always been something that you typically have to delegate to like a natively implemented function because the runtime is just not really designed for those sort of tasks. But since we're compiling straight to native code, we're able to take advantage of some things that we can't in the beam directly. So that would be, for example, loops that can be tiled or done like operations that can be performed with vector uh, map or the vector operations in assembly. So SIMD, for example, would be what I'm really referring to here. So anything that's like very number crunchy heavy could be done optimally this way. But more importantly with MLIR is that it does some clever things with loops and things that can be reduced to what are called affine loops. I don't think we need to really go too deep there, but the point is that we don't have to do any of the work to take advantage of the optimizations that it can perform on the code we're generating. We just have to make sure we generate it in such a way that it can do those things. So we're not especially interested in the near term, but we're interested in that stuff down the road. For example, the Palomay project that was talked about at ElixirConf this year, if you don't recall, that was basically they're doing a compiler transformation in Elixir, not you know with a new compiler, but that takes things like enum.each or whatever and actually maps those into low-level operations like the ones I was talking about. And it's able to generate extremely fast code for specific classes of things that they've identified. It's not a general optimization, but they're specifically optimizing for things that if you decorate them correctly, it can do those transformations. And so we're able to get the same benefits without having to specially treat functions that way. So we're hoping that it ends up being a more general solution for the same problem. And I know that the team that has been working on that is very interested in where Lumen ends up. But yeah, that, that was a very broad touch on all those different things, but hopefully that gives a yeah. overview of why we're using those things. And you haven't really even touched on the interpreter or the runtime yet, which are two totally separate parts of the project. Yeah, the, the interpreter has been basically a holdover that allows us to have the existing Lumen work be tested in the browsers without the CoGen backend in place. So that's, that was a thing Hans built and has been in the project since basically Elixir Comp and has been used primarily by Luke for doing testing of the runtime functions that he's been building in the browser. On the runtime end, you know, all this is built in Rust with the exception of parts of the CoGen backend, which are in C++, but the runtime is all built in Rust right now. So we're taking advantage of its standard library as well as some 
community libraries and the creates ecosystem to implement a lot of the runtime functions that are part of the Bean. I don't have anything in particular to say about the different runtime functions we've implemented. One of the things I did before I started working on the CodeGen way back last spring was implement like the allocators framework from Beam. I basically reverse engineered that and then brought that over and implemented in Rust. And then also the term encoding format and all that, that, which is extremely important for the code generation side because that defines how terms are represented in memory and, and how we consume and manipulate them. So those two components are part of like what I would define as the core runtime. And then the higher level runtime has two platform specific crates, one for WebAssembly and then one that's sort of more general, which is also used by the WebAssembly crate, but does not have all the browser functionality and things like that. Okay. So now that we kind of have an idea of to like what this project is, where did you start when you started the project? Like what, like there's so much here. Like, how do you even start to begin on a brand new compiler? I already had quite a bit of the design in mind when I started the project because I had been working on my own like compiler project over the course of a couple of years before that. You know, in my spare time here and there, it was not like a heavy duty investment time on my part, but a lot of it was just researching things because. Anybody who's even taken a stab at building a compiler knows that it's a rabbit hole in about 10 different directions. So no matter how much time you spend researching stuff, there's always something else to keep digging into. At some point, you have to just start building it. In this case, with uh, what we were going to build, the very first thing I wanted to do was get a front end in place so that I could get something that I could immediately iterate on. So once I have an AST then transforming that AST into something lower level that can then be used for CoGen was the approach I wanted to take. I already kind of knew roughly how I wanted to structure the IR and stuff. We ended up using Hans IR for that. And now the front end that I was working on lives as part of EIR and is maintained by uh, Hans. But that was where my part of it started. Meanwhile, Hans can talk about where he was at, but he was approaching the project from a different angle. Yeah, so this all started as like a free time project that I that I was just tinkering on a little bit. So I I too started out with with a front end, but I took a slightly different approach. I started with something called Core Erlang, which is an intermediate representation in the Erlang compiler. So I took that and I parsed that in, made an ASD out of it, and uh, lowered it down into a IR where I started doing some optimizations on it. And that's at the point where I got in contact with Paul and Luke at Dockyard. So once I started working there, things uh, changed around a little bit, but in the sense that, yeah, I got the front end from, from Paul and some of the semantics with the IR got changed around a little bit, but mostly in line with uh, what I really wanted to build from the start, which is really fun. Yeah, I mean, from there, it was mostly like forking in the three different directions it kind of mentioned, which is the front end, the runtime, and the back end. So I want to dive into some questions here about like some of the unique performance concerns you might have encountered while developing this. Uh, but before I do, I'm actually going to skip to a question we have later in the outline, which is uh, really around production readiness with Lumen. I'm really like when I was looking at the readme, I was really trying to understand like how do I pull this into a project and start writing my front end web application in it. And that was not clear to me. And so I think now would be a great time for you to sort of address that and tell us like, is that something that can be done at this point or are we still waiting on specific like mission critical features? It's definitely not at the point yet where you would be using it. We're super close to what I'll call like our alpha release, which is the first release of that includes the code gen backend and the entire like pipeline, right? So feeding in source and getting on executable or something you can run on the browser. With that, then it's going to take some time for people to kind of exercise the project, right? I um, mean, there's features that we have considered sort of semi important or like optional for this initial release. They won't necessarily be there, but you know the important things will be. 
for example, one of the things that's not going to be there like in this alpha release I'm talking about is an implementation of ads. But that's not to say that it won't be there indefinitely. It's going to just take a little bit of time for us to get like a bare bones version of it that is not very performant, but works, and then spend some more time actually building out a, a more complete implementation of that. And then there's a variety of like runtime functions that haven't been implemented yet. Uh, there's issues for that on the tracker, but Luke knows more about what is missing there versus isn't. But testing that in the browser, like trying to build some things, seeing what doesn't work the way we expect will be important part of getting to the point where we can say like, hey, this is production ready. But you could theoretically start using it at that point. The readme for, is out of date at this point. I really need to go through and like rework it because it was written way back last spring. And maybe a few minor changes have been made since then, but for the most part, it's remained unchanged. We do have like a domain that we're planning to put up like a, a cleaner sort of marketing site, if you will, with installation instructions, documentation, all that will be there. So before we really would ever say, hey, you can use this in a production project, all that stuff will be in place. We already have like basically the website implemented. We just haven't published it until we're ready for the that first release. We want to make sure that obviously there's something to use before we attract attention to it. Do you have any kind of timeline for when we would be expect to be able to give it a try? In yeah, sure. Right now I'm putting the finishing touches on the cogen side and I'm basically to the point where I would say within the next week or two weeks, we would have that initial release published with all the documentation and everything. Oh, so uh, right around the time that this podcast episode launches. Probably, yeah. Ooh. So that is obviously has a caveat in that if we hit something that is like a major issue, then that could potentially slow it down. But at this point, there's not enough really left for that to be a problem. And I'm talking more about like, we've got the code gen done, we're generating executables, but they blow up randomly during execution. You know, those sorts of code gen bugs are likely to be present for that initial release until we've had a chance to really suss out a lot of the bugs. One of the plans that we have for this on a testing approach is to run like the OTP test suite like using Lumen. So load up unit and a test suite for some component of OTP and run all those tests. But since we're missing some parts of OTP that are needed, like built-in functions, we won't be able to run all of the standard library right away. And so that's going to complicate the ability to run a lot of the tests initially. So for people that are using that first version of the compiler, they're really going to be sort of on the bleeding edge, helping us find bugs. But I do think that when we're at that point, if there's any, you know any interest from people that aren't working on the compiler part of it, but just want to help make it production ready, there's a lot that can be done there that's a low-hanging fruit. Anyways, hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, maybe we will return to that sort of notion of things that you could use help with from the community toward the end of the episode. But Eric, do you want to jump into some performance questions? Yeah, so like this is such a different project than kind of any other Elixir thing. So we're just kind of curious, like what what you have to think about as you're going through this. So like one of the things that we we have here is like interoperability with JavaScript. So like how do you deal with performance concerns in that? Besides, I'll let Hans answer like the compiler side of it. But as far as just beyond even just Lumen from a WebAssembly to host interop perspective, like WebAssembly is still cutting edge. Like it is under rapid development in all the major browsers. Well, Chrome and Firefox for sure. And early on, it had just a abysmal way of, or performance when copying data from WebAssembly into the host and vice versa. That has been worked around in two different sides. One is sort of like coming up with clever ways to pass data or avoid passing data. So in the case of Rust, I'll use because we're building on top of that and we'll probably be using a similar approach. 
data that's created on one side or the other rather than copying the data across except for when necessary. Instead, what you do is maintain like a table, that like a JavaScript object, right? And treat the fields of that object as like pointers to a value. And so what you do is you pass that pointer across the barrier rather than copying the data. A thing to be aware of in WebAssembly is that there is no currently yet way to pass, say, a string directly from JavaScript into a WebAssembly module or by basically integer values or arrays. So what that ends up being is, well, just actually integer values, but you can access memory in the WebAssembly module. So what you end up doing is passing a pointer to the memory you want and the length of that memory to integer values, and you use that to co- like read the memory in JavaScript. So when you want to copy a string, that's what you do. You pass a pointer to the string and the length of the string. The naive way of approaching that is that each time you want to call a function on one side or the other, you copy everything that you need to pass that way. So that was where that clever pointer trick came from, is to avoid that copy entirely. You just pass the pointers around as much as possible. The other aspect of that that kind of performance is that the browser vendors themselves have been working a lot to make it much cheaper to call functions on one side or the other. Initially, there was a lot of overhead just calling a function in JavaScript from WebAssembly or vice versa, and they've done a ton to improve that. So it's, I don't think it's perfect yet, but it's definitely gotten way, way better. And because there's constant development happening in that area, I mean, it's getting better and better all the time. I think that browsers themselves are trending towards using WebAssembly as their primary runtime and compiling JavaScript to WebAssembly, treating it just like another language, where Sort of right now and, you know, prior to this, it's been the WebAssembly runtime and the JavaScript runtime are using the same memory space, but they're sort of separate things. And so anytime you needed to interact between the two, it was a lot of additional overhead to make that happen. And as they're merged into sort of one runtime, that goes away. Yes, I think that pretty much deals with all the major performance things that we're dealing with that are sort of above Lumen's level. But Hans maybe can talk more about how we're dealing with performance when it comes to compiling the code on the front end side. Code gen back end side, I'm not doing too much to optimize things other than what I mentioned with like loops and stuff. But we're relying heavily on the web assembly back end in LLVM, which has a bunch of engineering effort into it uh, to optimize the web assembly that's generated. So on the compiler side, one of the major, major important points for us in order to generate fast and good code is to give uh, LVM enough information to be able to do those optimization that, that Paul talked about earlier. So since, since Erlang and Elixir, they're truly dynamically typed, there's no like real way to outside of dialyzer, but that doesn't apply to us very well. There's no real way to, to specify types in the language. So the naive way would be to just assume that every variable everywhere could be any type. And you can imagine if, if the, the backend, the, the lowering and the LVM would just like get a Erlang object, it wouldn't be able to do a lot of those optimizations that it would have been able to do on say an integer or four integers or stuff like that. So in that sense, it's really, really important for us to, once we have the initial initial prototype out to start working on type inference to uh, in order to give the L- uh, LVM enough data to do those important optimizations. So that's a whole other aspect of, of it that I, I've been thinking about, but there isn't mo- hasn't been much effort on that front yet. Yeah, and that will require some cooperation with both the broader community and just the compiler, like the Elixir compiler, right? because we need enough type information to be able to do that. Type inference is one aspect of that. The other is just, what do you do when you can't infer types? Um, You need a way to decorate them in order to say like, hey, assume that this is this type so that we can take advantage of our optimization and then have it fall back if for whatever reason the type is incorrect. Or you can even have a trap in the in the case that it's incorrect, but it's able to do much more effective opt- optimization that way. And I think another really important thing that's related to this is the issue of code size, which is going to be really really important for 
our uh, LVM, uh, I mean WebAssembly backend, to be usable in in uh, production apps. So in that sense, it's really important for us to have enough information about what modules and what functions and in, in modules are called so that we can remove the ones that are not used. Because you can imagine if, if you had to include the entirety of OTP and all of the functions in your app and all of the Elixir standard library, then that would produce a really large binary. So, so being able to figure out what's called and what we can safely remove is a really, really critical part in order to produce usable executables in the browser. Well, I'm sure that we could dive into the nitty gritty of this all day, but we do have just a little bit of time left and we've got several questions here specifically around Rust. So I've had a little bit of experience with Rust in the last year and it's not that I regret it because I don't, <laughs> but it was an experience. And I'd love to know, like, what, why, why are you writing this in Rust? What, what makes Rust the best choice for this compiler? Well, I mean, from my perspective, a major reason for the choice was that it's got really good WebAssembly tooling. And when I was diving in to start building the compiler, I had to choose what language I was going to use for it. By default, I would have chosen C++ because LVM is built in that. And that is just generally speaking, sort of a better language for building compilers. However, was already familiar with Rust and had done some programming in it and was interested to evaluate whether or not, aside from the tooling side of the equation, whether or not the language itself would be suitable for building compiler. I knew that I wanted to build the runtime in Rust because I could take advantage of the Create's ecosystem to implement a lot of things very efficiently, like without having to actually do a whole lot of work. But if we're building the compiler, I wasn't sure. But after exploring it a little bit, the language features, how to deal with mutability, uh, working with trees and things like that, where Rust does have some ergonomics issues, I felt pretty confident that I could do all of it in Rust and just delegate certain parts of the compiler into C++ where I needed to, basically for interop with LLVM. And then obviously once Hans and I started talking, the fact that what he had been working on was implemented in Rust meant that we could very easily hook up to each other's projects or really from the Lumen side make use of EIR. So that ended up working out really well, the fact that I, we had ended up going with Rust. That's my end of it. I don't, I don't know about Hans specifically. You can talk more about that. Yeah, so one of my major motivations behind what I started was to bring a more uh, advanced compiler to a lot of the beam re beam re implementations that have been done in Rust, at least partially. So there, there were a lot of uh, re-implementations going on in Rust, but all of them pretty much just focused on taking in the existing beam bytecode. So I, I sort of wanted to approach that from a little bit of a different angle and start with the compiler and see what I could do there different, differently than the original Erlang compiler. And I actually started it before the official Erlang compiler, at least before I knew that they were doing a SSA IR2. So I sort of saw an opportunity for a lot of interesting things I could do there and bring to those Beam re-implementations re in Rust. I'm not sure I knew that there was multiple versions of Beam in Rust going on. <laughs> They're all sort of like personal projects that people were, you know, picking up just as like a, a side project kind of thing. I think a few of them had been started and sort of went cold. And then there was a few other ones that were more active when I was starting to work on Lumen anyways. And that was another thing that I had looked at was whether or not to try and basically re-implement the VM or use one of these existing projects that were re-implementing the VM. As Hans sort of alluded to earlier, though, code size is a major issue. And with Beam bytecode files, there is no opportunity really to eliminate functions which are dead or basically any dead code elimination. The bytecode format is, I think, just in general, probably heavier than the equivalent object file uh, once the same code has been compiled to native code. 
that may sort of be a wash comparison wise, but a big choice too was the ability to take advantage of link time optimization by doing it ahead of time compiler versus a virtual machine that's loading up bytecode, which meant that ahead of time we could strip out everything that could be optimized. We could inline much more aggressively, reduce duplicated functions, and hopefully use that to reduce the code size down to the point where there were major savings, where it could be practical to use it in a production application where you really can't avoid JavaScript or, or WASM files that are larger than, say, a couple hundred kilobytes, particularly for mobile. The smaller, the better. But, you know, when I was looking at the smallest OTP application that I had on hand that was like realistic project, I took Timex and compiled that with and stripped all the beams and everything. And it was still... For all the beams in that project, not including Elixir or Erlang or anything, was over a megabyte, or almost a megabyte, sorry. Over a megabyte without stripping, um, just under uh, with the beams stripped, which is enormous. Like, that's not practical. And if that's one application out of many, not including the standard library, you get the picture. Like, it's going to be tens of megabytes, probably, for an, a standard application. So we really needed to be able to strip all that code out. And there's maybe ways that you could approach that with just a pure bytecode VM by sort of just saying we're going to remove things from the bytecode that we know we can get rid of. But I'm not sure how practical that is. I'm not sure the bytecode is in a format where you can do that sort of cleanup after you've generated the beam. Because all these projects still fundamentally depend on the Erlang compiler to generate the beam files. So uh, you either have to write a tool that post-processes them or make changes to the Erlang compiler to do that sort of optimization while it's generating the beams. But a lot of those optimizations can't even be performed unless you're doing sort of a whole program analysis, which is the thing that we can do with a ahead of time compiler, but can't be done really with a bytecode VM. So. All right. So I was listening to both of you were on the Elixir talk, an episode I don't know, a few months ago at this point. But one of the interesting things that I heard in there that I am personally more excited for than, say, WebAssembly was that it can also generate just a standard binary that can run on any machine. So like that's very, I don't know, that's a cool idea. Like, do we think that's going to end up being used more to maybe simplify deployment or anything like that? I mean, I know from my own personal perspective, that's a thing I want to use it for. I know I would use it to build little command line applications and, and tooling in general. Oftentimes, a lot of the work I've done for different employers has been tooling development. So if I could write portable command line tools in Elixir, I absolutely would. I guess the hope is to definitely make that a major feature of this as well. And I think like just an important thing to to point out, since we mentioned beam re-implementations, is that we're not trying to be a beam re-implementation in that sense. We we're taking a different approach and we're not our our goal is at least initially to target WebAssembly and the case where you want static executables. We're not doing a direct re-implementation of the beam in that sense. There are things the beam can do that we can't send like uh, hot code reloading and that kind of stuff. Well, I want to ask about these generic associated types in Rust because it came up before the episode and you both seemed like you had very strong opinions about... By the way, when I say generic associated types in Rust, I'm just parroting something that you said and I have no idea what that is. So what is a generic associated type in Rust and why are they so controversial? I mean, I wouldn't say that they're controversial. They're sort of a necessity, but the pain that they're intended to solve is replicating something called higher kind of types or maybe another way to refer to it is like type families. So it's a level of generic types that live a layer above a generic type. It's like generic generics, if that makes sense. So a, an example would be a list can be a generic type 
but a type family might be generic collections. They're, so a generic collection would be parameterized on the type of collection. That allows you to write code that does not care about the collection that is it receives. It just is able to call certain things that are part of that higher kind of types interface. There's a lot of things that are nice if you can write code that way, but in Rust, they don't have higher kind of types, and the closest thing that they do have are generic associated types on traits. So traits, if you're not familiar in Rust, are essentially the equivalent of interfaces or mixins from other languages. And you know they can be generic, so you can have generic traits. Generic associated types are, so a trait can also have an associated type. So let's say you've got a trait called reader. You could have a type that is like the type of the output of the reader. So it could be whatever, string, I guess. A generic associated type then is a associated type that is generic, allowing you to not care about the type of the output, but allowing you to specify a trait or an interface over something that operates on that associated type. Suffice to say that in practice, what ends up happening is the type signatures of anything using a trait with a generic associated type are highly verbose because you have to specify a bunch of type information. You end up with a lot of generic type variables and it's just not the ergonomics you really were hoping for. The one place that I tried to use them, I don't even remember the specific details. It's been a little while now. But I do remember basically reaching a point where I was like, this is unmaintainable garbage. I'm not, I can't use this. And so I ended up rewriting it in a simpler way. You know, I could afford to do that because I was the one that was consuming the API. So I just forced myself to duplicate code rather than try and write a generic interface. And that worked out in that particular case. But it's not as convenient if you're writing a library and you don't want to care about those things. Anyways, that's my perspective, Hans. Yeah, I had a uh, incident fairly recently where I found myself needing them, where on EAR, I had a, a pass on the IR that I wanted to be generic over operating on several kinds of sort of uh, IR containers. And without having generic associated types, it was very, very tricky to make things fit together within the width of my screen, which, uh, which sort of, it's really annoying when, when the feature is there taunting you behind the feature flag, but you can't really use it. And even if you enable it, then some things are not implemented yet. So it's like really not usable. Yeah. It's sort of a similar thing with const generics right now, which is another feature that is unstable, but allows generic type signatures to include constant values. So you can imagine allowing somebody to define uh, like an array type that takes the length of the array as a generic parameter. Like the implementation of a generic interface does not know the length of the array, but it gets it as a, a type parameter. So it can operate on the length of the array without knowing it concretely. So those const generics are that feature. And that's another thing that is sort of like kind of works. I mean, it's not part of the stable compiler yet, so it's not technically supposed to be like fully functional. It's being built, but it seems like that's another one that's got some rough edges on it still. I know that one's getting closer to stabilization, though. I think it's closer than generic associated types at this point. But both those things are powerful features that are nice to have and if the ergonomics are nice it's glorious but if the ergonomics are poor then it's almost worse than useless because it forces it invites you to use it you start using it you write code that's built on it and it turns into ugly unmaintainable garbage and so you're better off not having the feature at all and being forced to do things the harder way but resulting in better, more maintainable code than it is building it on this very fragile tower. And that's the other thing too. When when writing highly generic code that like that, you end up in a way or in a position where you can't see 
the points at which that genericism is going to fail you, you'll get all this delicate infrastructure set up and then you'll be like, shit, I need this one bit of information that I can't weave through this type infrastructure or this type hierarchy. All this is not going to work now. And unweaving that, like extracting it out into the parts that are going to work the way you need them to work means that you essentially rewrite it. I think I've hit that twice now working with highly generic types like that. Just toppling over your uh, tower of traits. Yeah, exactly. In Rust, my recommendation is to, you know, be more explicit more than not. Like try and avoid using generic types unless you have a clear need for it. A lot of times as engineers, we're like, oh, this should be a generic thing because it's an abstraction that's easy and I might as well not bake in like the type of this thing. But all it does is ends up obscuring the point. If you really don't need a thing to be generic, you don't need to build it to be generic right away. Better to come at that later when you actually know sort of the hierarchy of things and you really know what the generic interface is going to be rather than try and build it from the ground up that way where you don't really know what it's going to turn out to be at the end. I've made that mistake several times in my career working in strongly typed languages. So coming back to Rust and and building stuff after a few years of being entirely in Erlang Elixir and some Go, but Go does not have generics. So, you know, I basically had to readapt those lessons again. Like, oh yeah, I forgot that I can't just do it this way. You get used to how generic you can make things when a language is fully dynamic. Your functions can be as generic as you want them to be because you just dynamically decide what type something is as you're operating on it. You don't have that luxury in a language like Rust. But I can definitely say that for the most part, when I get something to compile in Rust, it is rare that it does not work unless I'm writing low level code. It's the low level things that are not really protected against. And in the case of Lumen, the core runtime pieces are full of unsafe code uh, because they're doing a lot of raw memory manipulation. But at, uh, at my level, that's really, that's the thing I love the most about Rust. I don't work a lot with unsafe code, mostly uh, safe data structures. So when I change like a big central part of my code base, I just compile and there's 800 errors. So you just start at the start at the bottom and work yourself up. When you're at zero, then it probably works, which is really amazing compared to compared to dynamically typed languages. It's a completely different way of thinking about refactoring. Well, I think that we could have done two episodes, probably one on Rust and one on Lumens. But I think it's important to have these conversations and dive into all the little nuances with the time that we have available to us, which is now at a conclusion. I do want to give you two the last words. Any final plugs, asks for the audience, social media, where people can find your library, Lumens, how to get involved with Lumens, support Lumen. I will hand it over to you guys for the final word on that. I mean, definitely anybody that's interested in contributing on sort of like the beta testing, I'll call it, of once we've got this alpha version of the compiler, uh, available for people to start playing with in browsers, we're really going to need to come at it from a variety of angles, have people that have things that they want to build, ideas that they would like to try out. And that'll help us drive which features we're going to prioritize, figure out you know what bugs exist that we haven't flushed out yet. We're going to be doing that work ourselves too, but I think having a lot of eyes on things, a lot of different little projects that maybe we're not going to come up with off the top of our head. All that's extremely valuable. You know, the other aspect of that is figuring out what parts of the documentation are insufficient or what issues with just setting up the tooling and and everything exist that maybe we've gotten little hacked in solutions on our computers for, but forgot about. Like I just replaced my laptop yesterday and there was some stuff I had set up in my build system for Lumen that I had forgotten I had done. And so things were not working when I tried to build it on my new laptop. So, you know, figuring those things out too is, is all part of it. And some of that's kind of annoying, busy work 
but it's all really necessary to getting something that's nice to use. So if there's people that are interested in helping us do that, then the more the merrier. Anything to add, Hans? I think in terms of community, I, I think uh, I want to invite everyone to come to the Lumen channel on the Elixir Slack. That's where we communicate a lot of the time. So that's really the best place to be for updates on how things are going. There's also obviously the Lumen organization on GitHub for the code. We have a weekly stand-up too that we're going to start. Well, as of this week was the first public one we had. But if you're interested in hearing us talk about the project, what we're doing, the progress and things, or you want to ask questions, that's on Wednesdays, I think, 10 Eastern. So yeah. the time and everything is in the Lumen channel and Slack. But. And all the old meetings are archived on the YouTube channel, linked in the Slack as well. So the Slack is really the place to be for everything. Sounds like a terrific resource. I will join the Slack channel for sure and scope it out. It sounds like you also have, you know, just from earlier in the conversation, you mentioned there's a lot of low-hanging fruit for developers who are trying to get into the Elixir world to help out on a project that's probably going to become a pretty major pillar in the community if uh, the last few conferences are, or the last major conference is any indicator. This has been a really fun episode of Elixir Wizards. Thank you again to Paul Schoenfelder and Hans Elias Josephson. Thank you guys for joining us all the way from Dockyard. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. And thank you to my co-host, Eric Ostrich. And once again, I am Justice Epen. Elixir Wizards is a smart logic podcast. Here at Smart Logic, we're always looking to take on new projects, building web apps and Elixir, Rails and React, infrastructure projects and Kubernetes, and mobile apps using React Native. We'd love to hear from you if you have a project that we could help you with. Don't forget to hit that like button and that subscribe button on your favorite podcast player. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Add us on all of those and join us next week for another episode of Elixir Wizards.